Bill's been a participant in the securities and finance industry for a lifetime. Um, he was part of the company that did the very first electronic trade. He's been a part, a part of and headed many um, startups. Um, and above all that, he's a veteran. Um, so we just want to thank you for doing this, Bill, and give you a quick round of applause. Thank you. So we'll just start with some basic questions uh, about your, um, your past, your history. Tell us about your family, what type of family you came from, um, things like that. Well, thank you, Lee, and thank all of you for sitting here and listening to this. <laughs> I hope it's entertaining, and I hope you learn something from it. I should quickly say that my voice is a little bit off because I had six weeks of radiation about, what, two months ago? So I'll be drinking a lot of water, and I'm going to be fine. I went back to the Mayo Clinic. It's an interesting place to spend six weeks, I can tell you that, living in a residence inn. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I just wanted to know why I'll be drinking a lot of water. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, outside of Chicago. Uh, I'm the oldest of three children. My sister's 17 months younger, and my brother's three years younger. And in, uh, when I was 16, at Christmas time, my father said, uh, oh, we want to talk to you about an idea. And we all sat there at the Christmas dinner table, and he said, we're thinking about moving to California. And we all went, yay, except for my sister. She didn't want to go because she had a boyfriend. <laughs> so she was outvoted four to one. <laughs> so we moved to California. I was literally going into my senior year of high school. A lot of people would say, gee, that's a tough time to move. But I looked at it as an opportunity because I could replant myself. Now, what does that mean? Well, I was more or less a geek and, and a sports addict and didn't quite know how to date girls. So on my way out to California, I was driving one of the family's two cars. I said to my sister, you're going to have a new brother when you get to California. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I'm not the guy that you think I am. And I'm going to change the way I behave when I get to California. And I'd like your help. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, I've had a hard time dating girls and so forth. If you can help me find one, that'd be great. <laughs> So my wife is sitting right here, Bonnie. Maybe she'll stand up, or at least wave. I, I met her six months after I got to California. Dated her and proposed to her on the second date. So we're coming up on 50 years of marriage next June. And so that's part of my story. Second part. Yeah. Second part of this story is I was blessed to have uh, a father that was also an entrepreneur. He had a, a degree in chemical engineering, but actually, and he worked for a chemical company from pretty much the time I could remember. Worked his way up, became president of the company, and I probably had the best chemistry set you could have. As on Saturdays, I'd go with my dad to the office. And then I'd sneak out into the lab, and there'd be one or two or three chemists out there, and I'd say, you know, I need this and this and this for my chemistry set at home. And they'd give it to me. So one of the things, I used to make bombs, <laughs> smoke bombs. I also made a rocket, which I waited until my parents went around, around and I, with my buddy, we went out to the front yard. It was made out of glass because that's the only material I had that I knew we could hold hydrogen gas in. So we had it all set up, and I lit the wick, and we ran away, and I saw the thing go right up there, and nothing happened. I thought, that's strange. I, I know this thing should go off. So I thought, well, I know what it is. There's, it's not getting enough oxygen right at the point of uh, where the, the hydrogens are coming out. So I got down close to it and blew on it. <laughs> It worked. <laughs> I'm just lucky to be here, I'll tell you, because this thing took off, and then I saw it go really high, and then I thought, uh-oh, it's going to come down somewhere. So I took off running, <laughs> and it came back down in the yard and, of course, broke into a bunch of pieces, and we cleaned all that up, and my parents didn't know that we had just done this stupid thing. 
At any rate, uh, that just tells you a little bit about my risk taking. I am a risk taker. And I'll get into that more when Lee asks some of the other questions. But I had a, the blessing of having a wonderful family life, which I think is, is a blessing. And unfortunately, my parents are gone, but they were here for a long, long time. And my dad gave me tremendous guidance. And one of the things I'll share is that not only did my father give me guidance, but I had two or three mentors in business that were just spectacular. One of them is 88 years old, still my business partner, and every day we talk, and to this day, because he still says things that are important. At any rate, I don't, I don't want to monopolize it all on my history I'll, here. I'll just talk loud. I'll let you keep the mic. Um, I'll let you have it. All right. <laughs> I, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of your family, Bill, and it's apparent that you, you had an incredible um, upbringing, and just, um, it just shows through all of you. Um, tell us about your college, and if you went to college, and where, and why did you choose that college? <clears throat> well, I, I was living in, in the Pasadena, California area, and because both my brother and sister were far better students than I was, uh, they both went to private colleges, and I decided to go to Pasadena City College because it was free. And I really wasn't that interested in college, to be honest with you. So my first semester, I joined a fraternity, and that's when my education started because, you know, I found out about <laughs> drinking beer and drinking too much beer. And um, so anyway, at the end of the first year, I was on probation. I had a 1.9 grade point average. And that basically meant that I got by by not going to class, pretty much in all the classes. I just didn't like college. It wasn't challenging. It wasn't exciting. And so then I dropped out. And I remember going home and telling my parents, because they got home and my suitcase was packed. And my dad says, what's this? I said, Dad, I'm, I'm moving to... Utah with one of my fraternity brothers. We're leaving tonight. And he said, you are, huh? How much money do you have? I said, I've got $50. He said, you're not writing home for money. I said, no, there's no way I'd do that. And I meant it. So we went off, we went to Las Vegas on our way, and I turned the 50 bucks into 100 bucks, and then we went on to Salt Lake City. Now this is during a really bad recession couldn't get a job to save my life, just couldn't get a job doing anything. So I said, you know, we got three fraternity brothers over in Denver and they're all employed. Let's go over there. So we jump on the bus in the middle of the winter and we head over to Denver. Get there Sunday morning at six in the morning, freezing to death, didn't have any winter clothes really. Knock on their apartment door and one of my fraternity brothers opens the door. They had just gone to bed a half hour earlier and he closed the door again. I said, hey, open the door. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? We said, we, we got to come in. We're cold. <laughs> so at any rate, I spent uh, about a year there. Uh, I worked in a factory in, in a job that was really nasty. I wore a rubber suit. I worked on a plating tank, if anybody knows what that is, plating one metal onto another. It was actually called, it was a very nice company, it's called Ford Aerospace. So we were making batteries for missiles. It was a big education and I volunteered. This is a theme, by the way, I wanted to share with you. I'm not afraid to volunteer. I would encourage you all to volunteer. I volunteered in the Army and they tell you, don't ever volunteer in the Army. Well, I did and I'm here to tell you, probably because I volunteered, I'm still alive because some of my friends aren't. But I volunteered to work actually for nothing in the chemical lab because I was, had a background in chemistry, although I never took chemistry. And I would clean test tubes and equipment and stuff. And so I worked with nine PhDs. This is after working in the factory. So basically I went in there for two more hours. The factory closed at 3.30 and I'd work till 5.30. And one of the, uh, two of the uh, PhDs kept saying to me, you know, you're too sharp. You, sh you should go back to school, get a degree. I said, I hate, I hate college. And they said, you're already maxed out. I said, what do you mean? They said, you can't make any more money. You can't work any longer hours. 
This is as good as it's going to be. They kept telling me this. So finally they wore me down and I thought, this is not the path I was thinking of. So I called my father up and I said, I'd like to go back to college. Of course, this was one of the best days in his life because he really wanted me to go to college. Both my parents did. And he said, uh, okay, he said, uh, I'll do whatever I can to help you. So I came back, had to go back to Pasadena City College because I had a 1.9 grade point average. <laughs> but this time I went back with a purpose. And so I started pulling grades and finally after graduating from a junior college, I thought, well, now let's see, where will I go to get my four-year degree? Ah, I know, I have to look in the catalog to see which college you can graduate from without a foreign language, because I still can't speak a foreign language. <laughs> and I had this mental block about it. So I went through all the catalogs and I finally found San Diego State. Don't have to have a, a foreign language. I said, oh, I'll go there. So I, w I went to apply there and they said, are you kidding? With your grade point average, you can't get in here. I said, well, there must be a way. And this woman said, well, well, yeah, if you take the college entrance exams and you finish in the top 10%, you can come in, but you'll be on probation. I said, okay, well, when can I take the test? Told me, I went, took the test, I got in the top 10%. And then she said, now you understand you're on probation. Anytime you don't pull a 3.0 average, you're out of here. Okay, so I went from the dean's probation list to the dean's honor list and stayed at the other end. So basically, what do I think about college? I'm not a big enthusiast even to this day. I think it's overrated. I think you can educate yourself better than you can in a college, however, or a university. There are some attributes about going to college that I think do help you. One of them is your social skills. And I think it's a big thing. Another one is the people you get to meet. And I have guest lectured at Harvard, at Wharton, at, at Cornell, at a bunch of different big league universities and places that I never thought I would even see. And I'm here to tell you, and I, I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's feet when I say this, they're no better than the rest of us. There's some really bright people there and there's some not so bright people there. And the big thing is interchanging with people that you'd, you wouldn't necessarily meet. So that's what I see college as being or university experience. You, when you graduate, and, and I'm gonna get to this in a second, but I got out with a, a dual degree actually. I, it sounds funny, but I got, I got to where I really liked college and I was, I switched to a marketing major and then I went to the dean and I said, I want to change uh, my major again. And he said, oh, what do you want to do now? And I said, well, I want to get a degree in finance. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, if you give me a semester and summer school, I'll give you a dual degree. They're pretty close as you probably know. So I said, I'll do that. So I actually, in spite of not liking college, I went and got a dual degree in marketing and finance, and I'm happy I did because it's sort of two prongs and you need both of them. They really do teach you a lot. Uh, but I then got a job, fortunately, working on the floor of the stock exchange, and this was, it's a long story, but it was by accident. I went to work for a man that didn't have any kids, was in his 60s, had been on the exchange floor for almost 50 years, he was the dean of the exchange. He was as tough a nut as you'll ever find. Everybody was afraid of him, including yours truly. And I, when I got there, I'm spouting off what I knew, you know. And he said, son, your education starts here. I don't give it about your college degree. <laughs> and he wasn't kidding. And so basically, even though I just spent five and a half years getting a degree, I started to learn. And one of the things I learned early on, which, which I want to share with you also, in fact, a friend of mine wrote a book about sayings that he had heard, and I, I'm included in the book, and it, the saying that I said, this was at a YPO meeting, I was in Young President's Organization, if you're familiar with that. Anybody in YPO here? Well, if you get a chance to go in, you should do it. It's a fabulous education. But 
the thing he quoted me on was that I said, if you're not losing 30% of the time, you're not trying. And what I meant by that is you shouldn't be afraid to make a mistake. Now the guy I worked for, I thought would fire me if I made a mistake. Well, one day I made one. And I used to ride to work with him. And on the way home, I was thinking, man, this is a long way home. And I finally said, you know, Mr. Kalen, I would understand if you want to fire me. And he said, for what? I said, for the mistake I made today. He said, oh, hell, he says, you're going to make millions of mistakes if you do this job. He says, just don't make the same one twice. And we're going to get along fine. Well, you know what? He, he did more than you think. He freed me mentally to expand my horizon. He freed me to make mistakes. Just don't do the same one twice. And I say the same thing to all of you. What is experience? Mistakes. Mistakes. Experimentation. Experimentation. Trying. The thing is, the smart people learn from those mistakes. They say, ooh, that, that fire is hot. I'm not touching that again. <laughs> And I can tell you, I've had near-death experiences, <laughs> believe me. And, and maybe we'll get into those. Sorry? So don't blow the rocket. That's right. <laughs> well, you did a good job at hit, knocking out a few of my questions there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you, two-part question, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment uh, in your professional life and then also outside of your professional life? And that's a tough one. I guess in my professional life, I'm known as being straightforward and honest, and I'm proud of that. And this 88-year-old gentleman that I referred to was the chairman of our firm when I was a clerk. And one day, the phone rang on the exchange floor, and it was the chairman. And he said, I have Mr. So-and-so sitting here in the office. And, you know, he bought some of this, and I don't remember the stock right now, but he bought some of this stock, and he said, could you give me a quote on it? And I said, sure, it's 19 and a quarter at 20. Now, that means it's 19 and a quarter bid offered at 20. I knew the underwriting had been done at 20. So he then said, with, on a speaker, he then said, so Mr. Smith could sell some of his stock at 20, right? No, no, sir, he could sell it at 19 and a quarter. It's offered at 20. Now, I don't know whether that impacts any of you, but that's not what you want to tell the chairman. He wanted to hear, yes, sir, Mr. Smith could sell stock at 20, which would be a lie. It was about six years later. I had forgotten about it. And the chairman said to me one day, you know, you set yourself apart from most of the guys I know in this business. I said, how? He said, you probably don't remember it. And then he told me the story. And I said, actually, I do remember it. And he said, it would have been so easy for you to lie, but you weren't ready to compromise. I said, no, I wouldn't do that. And so one of the things I'll share with you is it's a lot easier to come with the truth the first time you're questioned. Because you don't have to remember. You've heard the saying. You don't have to remember what you said. You just tell the truth. And believe it or not, telling it the first time is easier than the 20th time. In other words, if you just automatically tell the truth, you don't have to worry about not telling the truth. So that's one of the things I'm proud of. I guess I could look at a lot of the, quote, things I've done. I guess that from a professional standpoint, having the vision to think in terms of actually creating electronic trading. Now, you don't realize what that means, but... When you work on the floor of an exchange and everything is paper, pencil, and hand signals and yelling, which is what it was when I worked down there, and to think out ahead and say, you know, this could all be electronic and it would be more efficient, cheaper, faster, better for the customer. Not better for us on the floor, by the way. And so, I had that vision in 1968, and we did the first electronic trade ever in the world in 1969. Now, that was archaic in terms of the technology and 
when I look at it today, it was slow, but it was fast. And I had people fighting us like you wouldn't believe. And the day we were to go live, that morning, and I was a floor governor by this time, the, the old timer comes up to the floor and, and he owned three of these specialist posts and he had a pair of garden shears with him. And I knew there was two big factions. Most of them were anti, anti-electronic trading. And in a loud voice, he said, no blankety blank computer is going to commit my capital. And he took the shears and he cut the wires. <laughs> and a cheer goes up from all the guys that were anti-electronic trading. And I said, this is one of these times where you just have to think fast. And believe me, I hadn't thought of it ahead of time. I said, sir, you're right. We'll reallocate all those stocks to, to other posts that want to trade electronically. You, we won't do that to you. And I turned around and walked away. The pro-electronic trading people then cheered. And about five minutes later, a little junior clerk comes up to me and says, uh, do you think you could reconnect those wires? The old man wouldn't do it. He was too proud to come back and admit that he was wrong. He sent one of the kids in and I said, yeah, I think we might be able to do something. So a couple of things that you learn from that. One, it's never fun being out on the bleeding edge. You, you know, leaders take a lot of arrows and most of the time they don't feel good. And I've had plenty of experience taking arrows but 50 years later, whatever it is, 45 years later, I'm proud. I'm proud to say that I did electronic trading at a time when, frankly, nobody thought about it. And then I went on to build the largest electronic trading system called Instanet. And I'm proud of that. And I'll share with you something about that. We moved to New York. We were not New Yorkers. Bonnie didn't want to move to New York at the time, but she did. And we spent five and a half years there as I built Instanet. One of the interesting experiences, if you're ever lucky enough to have a company that grows at 100% per year or more compounded for five years, you'll find out it's, it's a difficult task. Because what happens, and I, I didn't have the vision to understand what was going to happen. I'm out hiring people that fit the slots that I needed. So I get a CFO that's capable of doing the job that we needed that day. Well, one year later, the company is twice as big, and two years later, it's four times as big. Do you think the CFO that I hired can keep up with that? Generally not. And they certain, certainly couldn't by the time you're eight times bigger, or 16 times bigger, or 32 times bigger. This thing is like getting on a, a bucking bronco. It doesn't stop. So I then, after about two and a half years, thought, I've got to hire way ahead. I've got to think about where we're going to be and hire the best people. So when we hit 100 employees, seven of my employees were past presidents of other companies. Now, managing seven guys that have already run their own companies is also a challenge. But it's fun. You, got, you have real horses that you can really count on, and you can run fast. And so one of the other things I learned is that always hire people that are better than you are. Smarter, faster, whatever it takes. Just don't be afraid to hire really quality people because they'll just make you look good. <laughs> it's simple. Everybody laughs, but it's true. If you hire dumbbells, what do you think your company's going to look like? Pretty dumb, right? So don't be afraid to go out and find the highest quality talent you can get. And part of it is selling them that this is the place to be so that they, they feel like they're part of the action and they'll help you build the company. And don't be, af by the way, when you're growing that fast, the opportunities run ahead of anybody that's there so they never worry about is there a slot of, above me that's open. I will never work in a company where you have to wait for the guy to die <laughs> to take the spot above. I don't, I don't want that. So I don't know whether that answer. Oh, you had a question about the personal. Yeah, your personal. Um, well, that's easy. My wife's sitting right here. <laughs> Do I have to say any more? I thought that might be the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've accomplished so many notable things and been successful in so many things. 
Talk about some of the things that weren't so successful. Well, number one, I didn't have a very good grade point average in college. But that's, that, I can look back at that and, and, and make excuses and so forth. But I've had several near-death experiences in business. And the first one happened, it's funny, I was in YPO and a YPO, an older YPO friend of mine said to me, are you sure you want to do what you're doing? And I didn't understand what he was trying to tell me. And I said, of course I want to do this. Well, I was stepping out in a, in a similar business in the financial world, but a much higher risk area. And I didn't appreciate how much risk there was. So Bonnie was recalling it earlier this evening when we were getting ready to come over here. She said, I'll never forget the night you came home and sat down on the edge of the bed and you said, take a good look around because we may not have this in a, in a week because I thought we were going bankrupt. And I was a general partner in a partnership and we were losing money so fast you guys wouldn't even believe how fast we were losing it. And I could see that we were going to go under. And believe it or not, I had to call the chairman of EF Hutton, whom I knew, on a Sunday night in New York and asked to borrow $10 million unsecured on my name for a week. And he asked, do you have anybody else you can call? I said, no, that's why I'm on the phone to you. <laughs> And um, he said, let me think about it. And about 20 minutes later, it was around 11 o'clock in New York, he called me back and he said, if you need it, I'll loan it to you. Well, Tuesday morning we needed it. And the reason we needed it is we were going through a, I don't want to get too technical, but we, we were essentially getting margin calls. Now, because I could see this coming, I had already sold enough to meet the margin call, but it wouldn't settle until Thursday or Friday, and this was Tuesday. So I had to bridge three days. And so we borrowed the money and we paid it back on Friday, as I said I would. So that one was a very close call. However, we had lost 90% of our capital. We had 30 million in capital and we had 3 million left. And I'm a general partner and I had you know, some people in as investors like Henry Ford, Dr. Denton Cooley, uh, heavy, heavy, heavy hitters. Now, what do you, I'm 43 years old, I think, at the time, or 42. What do you tell them? Hey, I just lost 90% of your money. That's when I decided, by the way, to go build Instanet. And I did it so that the investors could get their money back. And those that stuck with me, and many of them did, all got their money back because our stock went from 50 cents to $144. Took, you know, five years to do that, but we got it back. And I took all those investors that wanted to stay with me along for the ride, so to speak. So that was one of my disasters, if you will. The second one I'm, uh, is more recent. And, and I want to share it for several reasons. For one, we were living in Durango, Colorado, which is similar to Coeur d'Alene in many respects, except it's about a third of the size and it's very isolated. There's very few towns around it. It's a four hour drive to Albuquerque. It's a seven hour drive to Denver. It's a six hour drive to, to Phoenix. You get the picture, there isn't much around it. Beautiful place. Most people think small. Now, when I say think small, I'm talking about how they see the world when they live in a place like Coeur d'Alene or Durango or any small town. I'm here to tell you that based on some inventions that we had, we raised $350 million in little old Durango. $350 million. By the way, we lost it all. <laughs> I'm not happy about it, but... And I'm not going to make excuses, but uh, the SEC reversed an opinion on us. Basically, they were killing us because we were a huge threat. Now, the amazing part of this story, by the way, the $350 million came from professionals, not from individuals. It came from Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Payne Weber, 
uh, all the household names you know, Credit Suisse First Boston, usually in about $10 million chunks. Um, tomorrow is an interesting day. None of you will even know about this, but tomorrow the New York Stock Exchange will cease to exist. I'm talking about tomorrow. When the bell rings tomorrow, it's not the New York Stock Exchange as a standalone exchange. Anybody aware of that? Are you, Nick? Okay. What I mean by that is the international ICE, ICE ICE, and by the way, the guy that founded ICE is a guy that I know and we've talked in the past. ICE has acquired the New York Stock Exchange, and I'm here to tell you that the thing we invented would have prevented that if the New York Stock Exchange had embraced it. But they were Luddites. They were no way. We, we've been here 200 and some odd years, and we're going to keep doing it the same way. Well, they did it until they can't do it. When I went into the business, New York commanded 90% market share. They're down to around 20 to 25% market share. It, I mean, if you'd told me that 50 years ago, I would have laughed at you. But it's true. So that was a painful, painful experience because I worked five years for no income. Zippo, zero. That's, you know, you have to have some staying power to do that. And it hurts when you get the rug pulled out from underneath you because of things that you didn't have control over. But that's life. So I didn't quit. I'm back doing something new. And I think you have to keep bouncing back. And it, it goes back to my comment. If you haven't lost 30% of the time, you haven't tried. And I just can't tell you enough. Keep trying. Don't let a, a, a for, I mean, I'm telling you big failures, big numbers. Believe me, I'm front page of the Wall Street Journal. It's no fun. But you can bounce back. I'm here to tell you, I'm bouncing back now. I love it. And, I, and the, the part that gives you the excitement and the energy is the innovation. I, I love the name of this group, by the way. I'm an innovator because ideas give you energy. Now, my wife says people give her energy, and I understand that. But to me, thinking and ha coming up with new solutions and new ideas is really powerful stuff. On the topic of, that you brought up, innovation, Nick, Ryan, and I, we've had a few conversations talking about specifically the Coeur d'Alene area and that many of us, or us three in particular, have met many people in the area that have innovative ideas. And, um, just talking about raising the 350 million of VC, how do you go about doing that? How, I, I feel like I talk to a lot of people who um, have great ideas, but you know, they can't get the startup. So what, maybe more specifically, how, how would you um, go about doing something like that? Well, first of all, like anything in life, each step is a, is a baby step, if you will. So the first thing I did was raise $3 million, and I did that with friends and family. And I did it by being a good salesman. I mean, quite frankly, you have to be able to sell your idea to other people in order for them to open their checkbook. If you can't do that, you'll, you won't get any money. So start small, and if it doesn't work, it's a small loss. But as it begins to build and your needs increase, then go raise more money. Now. Lee, it's easy for me to say that to you, but I can tell you it's, it's tough. And I can remember many times using my frequent flyer miles to fly to New York, staying at cheap hotels, sometimes with three of us in the same damn room because we couldn't afford to pay the hotel room in New York, but we'd show up and we would sell and we would go take on the biggest people. That's one thing I'm going to say. I've never met anybody that I wouldn't talk to. I don't look at anyone as being, gee, they're beyond approach. That just isn't true. You can go, I remember setting a goal for myself that in 48 hours, I would talk to the six largest brokerage firm chairman or presidents in 48 hours, and I did it. And I sold five of the six. Now, 
you just have to have focus like you wouldn't believe to do that. And you have to know what you're talking about. And you have to have a good story. There's no question. But what does it take to sell? It takes conviction that what you have is correct. It takes conviction that you have something unique. So if your idea is that unique, and I get hundreds of them brought to me, the problem is they aren't that unique. You know, you have to have something that truly is unique. Now, the fact that you're in Coeur d'Alene, there's some advantages. One of the advantages, by the way, when you, I've lived in New York, I've lived in Chicago, I've lived in LA, I've lived in Durango, lived here. What do you think the biggest advantage is living here? It's cheap, okay. Not necessarily, I can find cheaper places. <laughs> Natural beauty. Real people. Real people. Collection of people. Successful retired. Yep, those are all good. In, hmm? Well, this is gonna surprise you. When you live in New York, you're dealing mentally with what I call incoming. And if anybody knows what that means in a military sense, it means you're receiving fire from somewhere. Rockets, howitzers, whatever it is, and you're uncertain as to where it's coming from. It's not fun. In New York, you're under constant bombardment of incoming. Just getting a taxi. Just getting your damn newspaper in the morning. Just everything you can think of is incoming. Now, what does that do to you? It challenges your mind to have the opportunity to think. And what I found in Durango and I find here and even more remote places is I can think. I'm not being bombarded just to stay alive, which you are in New York. I mean, it's intense. Anybody that's been there knows it's intense. Everything you do there is intense. You know, you have to fight to get into a restaurant. You have to do, fight for everything. And so you don't have a lot of cycle time to think. Here we do, and I relish it. And I like when the phone doesn't ring for four or five hours because I can actually spend the time thinking and being creative. So. Well, in transition to talking talk about being creative, I know that's one of your passions. Um, what, uh, what advice would you give to someone um, about being successful relating to creativity? Well, first of all, I taught a class at Fort Lewis College in Durango on creativity in the business school. I, I taught that for fun because I felt that I had a unique perspective, I still feel that way, about the subject of creativity. And I want to share it with you because I think it's, it's especially for a group that's interested in innovation or creativity. Uh, most people in the world, certainly in the U.S., somewhere around the third grade, your teacher says, no, Bill, you don't draw the tree this way or the house this way or whatever. And at that point in your life, whatever natural creativity you had, and everybody has it, by the way, starts to get pounded out of you. You become a conformist. You're going to draw the way the teacher said to draw, or you're not gonna pass. And, and same thing in mathematics. If you don't do it the way the teacher says, you're not gonna pass. Now, I flunked college algebra. I'm a good mathematician. I'm a very good mathematician. In fact, I was so good I didn't go to the class. So I took the midterm and aced it. Took the final and went, whoa, haven't seen this one before. So I spent a fair amount of time, but I solved the problem. The pro and I was correct. But the professor failed me. So I went in and challenged him. And he said, you didn't do it the way I taught it in the class. And I said, well, I would have thought you'd given a bonus for somebody that could figure out on their own how to solve this problem. You weren't in the class. So what does those two little stories tell you? It's basically, and that's what I hated about college, is they're trying to make you a conformist. They're trying to beat into you a certain way to do something. What they should be doing is teaching you how to think, how to be creative. 
So I decided to teach this class for fun. And the first day in the class, I, I said to the students, uh, I bet you think you're in this class because this is going to be easy. And they all, what's he got in mind? I said, it's going to be easy if, if, you, if you work with me, but it's not going to be easy just as a ha-ha and you can go to sleep in here. Because if you think that, you better leave now. Because we're going to use the gray matter. And I'm going to tell you why you want to use it. I'm going to tell this group why you want to use your brain. If you've ever been to China, and especially if you've been in any of the factories there, the working conditions are not very good. And most of the people are paid like 35 or 40 cents an hour. And I said to the students, you know, when you get out of college, if you want to compete with them, you're not going to get paid $20 an hour or $40 an hour or $100 an hour or $500 an hour to do what they're doing. You better be doing something else. And what is that? It is using your brain. It is being creative. They make the chips over there, but the intelligence, by and large, is sitting in, in Silicon Valley. The high-paid people are, are the ones that are inventing that kind of stuff. They're the ones that get paid the big bucks. And so we talk about the process of creativity. How do you break free of what you've had pounded into you for so many years? Well, one, one way, and this is the way I generally teach it, is you do classic brainstorming. And most people don't do it correctly. And what I want to get at is that when you brainstorm, you're in the gathering phase, that is, gathering ideas. And it is a big taboo to say anything about an idea that's presented. So I'll give you an example. The first Usually the first thing I do as a uh, class project is I bring a glass, a bottle of wine into the class. Now that gets their attention. And I put it up on the, on the lectern and I say, um, anybody in the class know what happens if you open a bottle of wine and you pour a glass, you put the cork in it and you put it in the refrigerator and a week later you take it out. Anybody know what happens in this group? Bingo. Why isn't it any good? But why does it expire? Oxygen. Every class, by the way, these are college students. All of them got it. Somebody always had the answer. I said, OK. So our project today is to think of as many ways as we can to eliminate the oxygen problem. It's exposure to oxygen. It begins to oxidize. You know that we can always get 25 or more suggestions. And we'd write them on the board. We didn't allow them to laugh. We didn't allow them to complain about them. We didn't judge them. We got 25 to 30 of these things up on the board. And then we shifted into the analysis phase, that is the critique phase, after we had the ideas up there. And I developed a, a new term, which I haven't seen used so far. And it's what I call tangential creativity. Everybody knows what a tangent is. If I say to you, this is a bad idea, right here, and you, your mind starts thinking about this bad idea, pretty soon one or more of you will have a, something that hits that bad idea and goes off into a tangent that solves whatever that problem is. If I take that away, do you have anything to think about to solve? No, you don't. So it is the bad idea that creates the environment, this is really powerful if you think about it, that creates the environment for the solution. It's not the correct idea. As a matter of fact, most times you know, people say, oh, the light bulb went on. That's nonsense. The light bulb doesn't go on. Edison tried 10,000 times, I think, to get the light bulb. So he had 9,999 at least failures. But I'll tell you what, he was always looking at, at this. And eventually, he got the tangent that said, ah, there's, there's the solution. And I can't tell you how many times I've had. I have multiple issued patents, by the way. And I can tell you, every one of them, there isn't one exception that didn't come from this process. None of them were like the light bulb went on. I said, oh, I know what to do. It doesn't happen that way. I mean, I suppose occasionally it does. And I'm not going to take that away if you're lucky enough to hit that. 
But if you really want to have the process of creativity, follow what I'm suggesting. And by the way, you can do this by yourself. It's more powerful if you have a group. Why? Because you've got the collective brain power. You've got many brains working on that as opposed to one. But it can be done by yourself. The second thing I wanted to share on creativity that I also teach, and that is that most creativity takes place at the subconscious level, not at the conscious level. So how do you feed the subconscious? Anybody have a thought on that? If you're trying to think about it, how would you feed it? Uh, with emotion attached to um, an idea. Okay, give me an example. Uh, I'm just thinking that you, you have to have some sort of, um, I don't have a good example. <laughs> well, usually the reason you, you you're, when you're working on something that's around creativity, and by the way, creativity isn't making things necessarily. It may be figuring out the most efficient way to get from point A to B. It might be how you dress in the morning. I mean, it can be all kinds of things. But let's say that it's a much bigger problem that you're working on. I have found, and I advocate this a lot, that if you'll put down on paper and one of my inventions, I know exactly how I did it. I had a problem I was dealing with. I was on a, several mining company boards and they were experiencing the same kind of problem. And it seemed counterintuitive to me that they would have this problem. So on a Saturday, sitting by the swimming pool in Southern California, I sat with a legal pad and I put down all of the attributes that were on one side of the ledger, if you will, and all the attributes on the other because they, they didn't seem to come together. And then I laid it down and I left it alone. <clears throat> what I would do is before I went to sleep at night, I'd look at that list. Now I wasn't at that moment in time trying to solve it. I'm feeding the subconscious because during the night, your subconscious is working. If you don't feed it anything, then it'll work on whatever it wants to work on, which may be a nightmare or maybe some kind of a dream that you, you know, but it's not a very high use. Use those cycles, if you will, to your advantage. So feed your subconscious. Now the second way I have found to do that, and this one, it took me a long time to understand this. I worked for seven years without taking a vacation. Seven straight years without a vacation. I thought I was doing the right thing, but I wasn't. Because I was burning out, I wasn't emotionally as sharp and I didn't certainly didn't have the creative edge so by accident I went on a long trip and it was like for four or five weeks and I found for instance I, I've been to Africa 22 times and I usually go for an extended period somewhere between two and five weeks at a time before I go, I don't necessarily feed my subconscious quite as actively as I'm suggesting, but I do try to feed it. And when I get over there, because it's such a different environment, I'm not thinking about that list. I'm not thinking about business. I'm looking at animals and the beauty and everything else for weeks. I come back and I get back into my environment and you would not believe the outrushing of creativity. So what's happening is you're giving your brain, your subconscious, time to process and think about these things. And it does work. So when I talk about teaching creativity, I'm not teaching somebody how to draw a drawing or paint a painting or play an instrument. That's not what I have. I'm teaching them how to think about how do you become creative? Because that's really the trick. If you can become creative in whatever field you want to be in, you'll be an inventor. You'll create something. It's not as hard as you think. Unfortunately, our educational system doesn't help us. But we, we're adults. We can figure out how we can change ourselves. And the other thing I'm going to say is that today, we have one of the greatest tools sitting in front of us, the Internet. I use it every day. And I use it in a variety of ways. 
I use Google literally every day. I use Wikipedia literally every day because I'm looking for solutions or information or ideas. And I'll often, if I have the time, particularly on the weekends, just follow a path that I never thought I was going to take. You guys, any of you that have ever done that know what, you, what I'm talking about. You just start following this thing and your mind starts working and the next thing you know, you've thought of something you, you never thought you were going to think of. So we have powerful, powerful tools in front of us. Just like Abraham Lincoln had to read, you know, with a candle or a, a lantern and read a few books. We get to do that every single day. It doesn't cost us anything. It's amazing. And then the third point I'm going to make is there are software, there's tons of software today that help you in the creation process. I'm not going to recommend any of them in particular. I, I personally have used one called Inspiration. It's real easy to use. It's both an outline form and a diagram form. I start with the diagram and I just start putting things in. And then you hit a button and it makes an outline out of it. And it, it, that's the way I implant that, those ideas into my head. Because I don't necessarily try and tie them together. If any of you have ever had writer's block, the problem you have when you have writer's block is you're trying to get the finished product. Back away from it. Just put the ideas down. Let them just flow. Come back to it. Do it some more. All of a sudden you think, well, that's obvious. I know what I should write about. But when you have the writer's block, it's because you're trying to finish the job in one shot. Tough to do. you got to be in the zone, so to speak. But feed that subconscious and it'll happen. I think we have time for one more question, and then I'll have Ryan come up here and close things out. Um, as far as the topic of feeding your subconscious, I, I also think of feeding with positive materials, feeding your mind with um, good positive materials, reading, things you're watching, things you're listening to. Um, Two-part question. Um, first part, give, just give us three titles of books that you, your favorite books that you would recommend to read. And second part is, when we were on a conference call, me, you, or you, Nick, and I, uh, a couple of weeks ago, you brought up the book uh, Anti-Fragile, and I looked it up and started reading it, um, very intrigued by it, and I, I just want you to expand on this um, little quote I took out of it, uh, the resilient resists shock and stays the same, the anti-fragile gets better. So if you could maybe quickly... Um, give a quick idea of what you feel anti-fragile is and what you think of that passage. Uh, the author uh, wrote a book that many of you may have heard of, that's, that, that's Black Swan, and this is his newest book, and I think it's even better than Black Swan. But basically, what he's referring to is the ability to be able to adjust to the new incoming information. I mean, that's my words for it. But basically, how you build something that will last in an ever-changing world. And of course, the best at that are the brains sitting in the room. The human brain is incredible if we let it do its thing. But we tend to get lazy. We tend to accept things the way they are. I'm always challenging. Everything I see and do, I'm challenging. It's because I want to make it better. I wouldn't have done electronic trading if, if making money was my objective, by the way. Because it was counter to what I knew. I knew how to make a lot of money on the floor of the exchange. Why? Because we're taking advantage of the customer, legally. We had time advantage and physical advantage and information advantage. And you guys would send your order in, and I used to call it sending an order in through a marionette that had very loose strings. <laughs> So it could take five minutes for your order to arrive at the post where it was going to trade. So the brokerage industry figured that out. They said, oh, well, we need market orders. What's a market order? It says transfer the ability to buy or sell to the end point with an uncertain <coughs> outcome. I never use market orders. Because I, that's like opening your checkbook and leaving it on the counter at the coffee shop already signed. All you need to do is fill in the amount and the name. You don't want to do that. But 
As far as books are concerned, Lee, I, I have a hard time with that one because I, I read a lot. And I think there's a lot of books that you can read. I do believe there's some categories. I would highly encourage you, my wife says I've read 25 books on creativity. I've probably read 50. And I would say get one or two. Get yourself thinking about how you become more creative. There's some fabulous books out there, and I don't want to pick any particular one, but the subject is powerful. And you can go on the internet and do the same thing. One of the problems I have today in picking a book is that we're in an ever-changing environment. I like the anti-fragile because it's new and it's, it's fresh. Uh, I think there's a lot of books in the area of positive thinking. If you can't tell already, I am a positive thinking person. When I wake up in the morning, I'm not worried about something. I'm going out to attack. I do that every day. And, and I get up, by the way, at 4 or 4.30 in the morning every day, even at my age. Why? Because I'm excited. I'm excited to go take on the world. And you should be. And if you, if you approach the world with any negativism, that's what you're going to get. And if you go after positive, that's what you get. So you can think about it. Do you want positive or negative? I know what I want. I want positive. I want reinforcement every day that I can get it. And, you, you, and it's, you're capable of doing it. Everybody in this room is capable of doing it. In fact, I, one of the exciting things is I don't see any reason why someone living in Coeur d'Alene can't be the next Bill Gates if they want to be. Bill Gates didn't grow up in, in New York City. He didn't graduate from college. He didn't graduate probably for the same reasons I didn't like it. it they, he didn't want to fit the mold, which is interesting. And there's a lot of smart people out there that don't want to fit the mold. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Your insights is incredible, and I am extreme, extremely grateful being here and giving us your time. Uh, Ryan, you want to come up and close things out? No, it's been awesome. Thank you. So we just wanted to give an opportunity. We ran a little bit over on time, yeah, but right, we have a few minutes for burning questions, if you have any. Um, and if not, we'll be able to hang around a little bit longer sure. afterwards. So, Drinks afterwards help us finish up the rest of the beer before we're taking it home. And if anybody's got a question, there is a hand. Uh, Could you talk a little bit about the challenges of being a creative in the business world? Uh, the question is being being creative in the business world. Well, one of the challenges is, especially if you're in a big company. Is that by and large, big companies, and, and I don't understand this, but they don't really want you to get out of line. And it's one of the reasons I, I worked for one big company in my career, only one, and it's because they acquired Instanet. That was Reuters. And I was um, chairman of Instanet at the time, and they brought Instanet into their organization, and Reuters was a 150 year old, stayed. British company. They had manuals for manuals. <laughs> I mean, it was just unbelievable. And I went to a meeting in London. I used to go to London once a month from New York. And I went to this meeting, and there were four senior executives at this dinner. And one of them turned to me and he said, Well, now there are five. I said, What do you mean? Said, well, there's five of us, and they're running for the top job here. I said, If you're referring to me, you're wrong. I don't want anything to do with it. And I didn't. But they didn't believe me. So they made life as miserable as they could because they want to weed out a challenger. Now, I knew what they were doing. And it, I, I lasted a year and a half because they just couldn't stand it. They came me very well, extremely well. And I finally walked in and quit because they just couldn't stand the structure and the lack of creativity. As an example, got a memo from the president of the company in New York. A memo. Not even with my name on it. It was to all the subsidiaries that reported to him. And it said, you know, as of now, you'll have a capital expenditure limit of $25,000. So I called up the president. I said, Andre, 
I got this memo. I assume this was not intended for me. Oh yeah, I mean, you're absolutely it's intended for you and everybody else that reports to me. So I said to him, what did I just get a case of the dumbs? And he said, what do you mean? I said, I didn't have anybody tell me what I could spend money on. If I had to spend a half a million dollars and we had it, I could do it. You thought well enough of what I had done in the past to come in and do an unfriendly tender offer for our company. Now, I must have gotten awfully dumb since that happened. You know what his answer was? I want to have control. So I said, okay, here, you control it. I'm leaving. So I, I understand the question. Try to get yourself into an organization where they value the creativity. There are big organizations, by the way, that do. 3M is an example. But there's, there are others. Microsoft does. Now you've got to get in the right spot in those big companies or you'll struggle. But there are many of us that value creativity. I do. I mean, I'm always looking for someone that's creative. And the more creative they are, the more I give them. Because there's no limit to what they can do. But it is a difficult problem. And it's, you know, if you want to see a lack of creativity, look at our government. <laughs> and I'm not making a political statement. I'm just saying that any aspect of our government, there is zero creativity. Yes, sir. So piggybacking on that, how do you manage you know, a, a, your creative solutions in a highly regulated environment like securities or medicine or some of these other areas? Well, it's a very good question. First thing I would say is if you do invent something, the next step is to go figure out where it fits in the regulatory scheme of things. That means reading a lot of rules and regulations. When I became the chairman of the floor trading committee at the stock exchange, one of the things that happens, by the way, when you join the stock exchange, is you are asked the day you join, put your hand on the the constitution of the exchange, the rule book. And everyone says they've read it and understand it. And no one has. Okay? It is really boring, dry stuff. But I have done it. And when I was chairman of the floor trading committee, which is a group that adjudicates problems, I thought, well, how can I adjudicate it if I don't know the rules? So I read it, and I'm fortunate in having a somewhat of a photographic memory. So the first time one of the old timers did something and I had to go over and say, Tony, you can't do that. And he barked at me, you know, like he always did to everybody, like they would back off. And he says, <clears throat> says who? And I said, I'm telling you. Well, wh what did I do wrong? And I said, you wait here. And I went over, got the rule book, turned right to the page, and a loud voice read it to him. And he went, <clears throat> okay, and he changed. Do you think he ever challenged me again? No. But in order to get through the regulatory morass, and that's what it is, you have to really understand the rules. So we, let me give you one quick example. After we invented this Optimark, this $350 million invention, I knew the first stop I had to go to was the SEC. Now, I knew the rules so well. And I knew the guy that ran the Division of Market Regulation. I called him up and I said, Brandon, I need two hours of your time. Now, you don't realize how big a chunk of time that is to go get the head of market regulation and dedicate two hours on a phone call. And he said, when do you want to come in? And I called him and he said, okay, you've got it. I showed up for the meeting. I thought we would just be meeting in his office. And he said, oh, no, you're down in conference room A. So we went up in there to set up, and people started coming in. I said, this is for uh, Brandon Becker. They said, oh no, yeah, we work for Brandon. Oh, we heard about you coming in here. Now, they don't even know what I'm coming for. But eventually, he walked in, and he said, okay, what do you have? So we spent an hour and 45 minutes describing our invention. Very technical, quite a long process. At the end, he said to me, oh, so are you gonna be a broker-dealer? Or are you going to be a, a uh, alternative trading system? Now, in his mind, those were the only two answers you could have. And I already had anticipated that because I knew the rules. In fact, I was the first ATS, alternative trading system. That's why I knew it. 
And I said, no, we're not going to do either one. And he, and he said, well, how are you going to fit into the regulation? I said, we're going to be a facility of a stock exchange. And he threw his head back and he started to laugh. Now, I didn't know whether he was laughing at me or what, you know, I, just, I was sitting there thinking, and he finally stopped laughing and he said, that'll work. Now, that wasn't by accident. I already knew how to fit <coughs> into that whole regulatory schema, but I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't studied the living daylights out of it and understood what <coughs> part of that meant. So the answer is, you just have to figure out how you live in it. I've been on mining company boards for the last 10 years. If you want to find regulation, get into mining. You know, there's all kinds of regulation. You've got the, the environmentalists coming after you every day. You've got the uh, all the economic issues coming after you. There's all kinds of regulation. Just look what they did to Heckler here. They shut them down for a year. Imagine what that cost them a lot. But know your rules, if you will. If you know the rules, you can usually figure out a legitimate way to do what you want to do. And if you can't, you have to have the rules changed. I've done that too. <laughs> I mean, that's what you have to do. You know, it goes back to what I said earlier. I'm not afraid to go see anybody. I've seen the chairman of the SEC so many times, or other organizations. Like, I'm not afraid to go in there and see them. They're just like us. Most people don't think so. They think, oh, you're going to see the chairman of the SEC now. Okay. So, I know him. He's not going to bite me. <laughs> any, any other two in the back? You go first. Okay. Springboarding off the Hepla uh, comment, what, what's your outlook for the next year on mining stocks in general? Hepla and the core locally and others seem to be not respected right now. I assume it would tie in the price of precious metals, but with your background on boards and stuff, but what do you see in the next year? I'm still pretty negative on the on the industry. I don't think we've hit the bottom yet, and I don't think it's going to be a V-shaped bottom. It'll be a, a, a long process, and I, I'll just quickly tell you why I believe that. The Most of the junior mining companies in Canada are trading at a penny or two pennies or five cents a share, and there have been literally billions of shares issued over the last 10 years. I had this discussion with somebody today. I said, you know, those those 10, let's say it's 10 billion. I know it's more than that, but let's say it's 10 billion shares. Those shares all exist today. So I said to this person, how many people in Canada do you think ever invest? There's 30 million people roughly, and, and he said 10 million. I said, okay, so 10 million people own 10 billion shares. Every month they get a statement. And this garbage is sitting in their account. They don't, you try and sell them a mining stock and you've got absolutely no chance, in my opinion. It's going to take a new generation. And I think it's a long, long time. Does that mean you can't make money in this area? No, I don't think that's true, but it's going to be tough. Because you're, you're swimming against the tide. First now that's, by the way, I want to say that's, you asked two questions. I didn't say anything about the precious metals. I'm more optimistic about the precious metals being closer to a bottom and being able to move up. But, but it takes a <coughs> huge move to get these juniors off their back. Let's say for respect for everybody's time, can we hold the next question? And maybe you can personally address it to them in the back of the room. Sure, that's fine. Uh, we ran a little over. But thank All you, right. Bill. Thank you. We appreciate it.